Here are some reminders to help you get the most out of your dive math CD-ROM. First, remember that God gave us mathematics to use, number one, as a tool for studying his creation, number two, as a way to interact with other people, and number three, as a way for us to learn about deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, and analogies, which are the three main reasoning processes God has designed our minds to use. Apply what you learn about these reasoning processes to honor and glorify him. Now, when you're doing the Dive CD lessons, make sure you work the problems with me and take notes, or sometimes you can pause the CD and see if you can figure out a practice problem, fast forward to the answer. And if you got it right, go ahead and move on. If not, rewind and see what you did wrong. Pause and rewind as necessary until you understand a concept. That's the way to get the most use out of this CD is make sure you understand something before you go on. Do all the problems in the problem sets at the end of each lesson. And wait to use the solutions manual after you are finished with the problem set. Make sure and show your work on all your problems. And that means being able to tell where a mistake was. If you can do that, then you know you're showing enough work. And finally, have a good attitude. The best math program in the world won't do you a bit of good if you have a poor attitude, if you don't care, if you're being lazy or complaining or don't think that your parents should have gotten you the dive CD or whatever. Just have confidence that your parents are doing their best for you, that God has given you this CD for a reason. And therefore, you better make every second count and try to learn as much as you can while you have this opportunity. And I know God will bless you for your effort and for your perseverance for completing this course. Lesson 7 has several parts, beginning with the unit circle. And we've kind of talked about the unit circle already. Let's just think about it a little bit more here. We had this circle here, and let's say that had a radius of 1. I know it's not a perfect circle, but it should be good enough to help us understand here. If that had a radius of 1, that means that distance from here to here was a 1. Let's say that was a 45 degree angle there, we could make a right triangle off of that. That means that the opposite side would be equal to the square root of 2 over 2, and so would the adjacent side. The hypotenuse would be 1. We can use that unit circle idea to help us think about the different trig ratios when we're working with the Cartesian coordinate system. To help us understand the unit circle, let's look at this problem right here. We have a unit circle centered at the origin, and what I want you to do is find the coordinates of point P1. And I'll give you the angle here. We'll say that that angle between the ray and the x-axis is pi over 6. Think about what we have here. It's a unit circle. So basically that radius here is a magnitude of 1. We could think of it as a triangle. And so this is side 1. The horizontal side would be our x coordinate. The vertical would be our y coordinate. Let's go ahead and find our x coordinate first. And just think about this. How could we get x? Well, we know that cosine of theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. So in this case, that would be x over 1, or just x. Hopefully, you know that cosine of pi over 6, that's equal to square root of 3 over 2. So that's what x is equal to. Now, we could find sine theta. We could find y the, in a similar way using sine of theta. We know that sine of theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. So that would just be y over 1 for our instance, or just y. And sine of pi over 6, that's just sine of 30 degrees. Hopefully, you know that that's equal to 1 half. And so that's what y is equal to. We'll write our answer like we normally do a point 
our coordinates will say square root of 3 over 2 comma 1 half or 1 over 2 so that would be our answer there with a unit circle it's easy to find coordinates because x is just the same thing as cosine theta y is the same thing as sine theta we can also use that to help us graph sinusoidal patterns where let's just make a Cartesian coordinate system here and remember you're always supposed to work every problem with me that I work take all the notes anything I put on the screen you should take notes on it and and write that down you never just sit and watch the lesson unless you're trying to rewind a problem and understand where your mistake was so let's just go ahead and we have this Cartesian coordinate system and let's make tick marks every 90 degrees stretch it out here a little bit on the left side and so I'll put a 90 there 270 there minus 90 minus 270 now let's just graph y equals sine theta so this is our theta axis this is our y axis y equals sine of theta maybe you already remember how to do this if you do great but let's just go ahead and, and work on it anyway and think about what's happening here let's just think about some values of theta that we know or values of sine theta that we know when theta is zero sine theta is zero so let's put a dot there when theta is 90 sine is one so let's make a plus one and a minus one tick mark on our y-axis and it's kinda like the unit circle over there with a radius of one and we'd have a dot here at 90 degrees then at 180 sine theta would be zero 270 it would be equal to negative one and at 360 we'd be back at zero at minus 90 we'd be at minus one here minus 180 would be at zero minus 270 would be at one and then we'd be back at zero at minus 360 we can just go ahead and put a curve through those and this is what y equals sine theta looks like that's the graph it's a sinusoidal pattern it's a repeating pattern or a periodic pattern it looks like a wave basically and think about it from here to here is one wavelength the pattern repeats itself after we go from that minus 270 to the positive 90 value it also repeats itself when you go from 0 to 360 you go through one pattern lots of things in nature have a sinusoidal pattern to them anything with a frequency like sound or light or the waves of the ocean anything that vibrates it will vibrate at a certain frequency and that can usually be represented by a sinusoidal pattern it may not necessarily be y equals sine theta but it could be if that's y equals sine theta it should be easy to understand that cosine theta would start at one on the unit circle go down like that up through 270 and then back at 360 it'll be at one again and then it'll have this pattern to the left of the y-axis so the green is y equals cosine theta now it's interesting to just note there that it looks a whole lot like the sine function and that's why we just call both patterns sinusoid patterns and just think about it you could shift that cosine function to the right 90 degrees and it would lay right on top of or in fact be the sine function in fact we could write cosine theta as sine of theta plus 90 degrees cosine theta is the same thing as the sine function shifted to the left 90 degrees that's called a phase shift and we always consider the phase shift 
as that place where it's going up. If we were moving, if we were drawing that left to right, where it moves up through the x axis or the theta axis. We shift to the left 90, that means we say theta plus 90, because if we added a negative 90 in there, sine of minus 90 plus 90 would be sine of 0, which is 0. Cosine of minus 90 is also 0. Okay, so we've talked about the two fundamental sinusoid patterns, y equals sine theta, y equals cosine theta. Let's add a little bit more here, and this is something you want to write in your formula book just to remember some of the different components of the general form of these sinusoid functions. Y equals A plus B sine of theta minus D. where A is the amount that it's shifted up or down on the y-axis. So like our red sinusoid pattern there, that goes through the origin at 0. If that was 1 plus sine theta, it would go through the y-axis at a positive 1, and the peak would be at 2, and the bottom of it would be at 0. B is the amplitude. Right now our amplitude is 1, or in other words, the distance from the highest point to the x-axis or to like the midline of that sinusoid pattern, that's always an absolute value of 1. If B was 2, that distance from the midline of the sinusoid pattern to its peak or trough is always an absolute value of 2 away. And D is that displacement that changes the phase of the sinusoid pattern. If it was shifted to the right 90, then we'd have minus 90 as the phase angle. If it was shifted to the right 45, it'd be minus 45. If it was shifted to the left 30, it'd be a plus 30 in there. So that's our formula for sine. Cosine's very, very similar. It's just you change sine and cosine. A plus B cosine of theta minus d. Let's go ahead and do some practice problems. I want you to graph y equals 3 plus 2 cosine of theta plus 30 degrees. So what we should do here is our horizontal axis will be a theta axis and that will be at, I guess we could just say 3. We'll put a 3 right there instead of a zero. It's not really the origin. It's not really the, the normal horizontal axis. And then our amplitude, therefore, is 2. So here is a 5, then down to 3, and then here would be a 1. And if we wanted to, like the real axis would be down there somewhere. Now, since we have a phase shift involved, too, what we really ought to do is just go ahead and move the y-axis off to the left, and then just go ahead and draw in a sinusoid pattern. Just try to make it as neat as you can. And think about your phase shift. At minus 30, you'd have cosine of minus 30 plus 30 would be cosine of 0, so that would be a positive 1, and then you'd have 3 plus 2 is 5. So let's make this mark right here at minus 30 degrees. And then just a little bit to the right then would be 0. And we'll just call that our real y axis. So this right here would be 180 degrees away where it has a trough or a low spot in the graph. And that would be at minus 30 plus 180 would be 150. At another 180 to get to right here. And that would be at 330. And then over to the left, we could do right here would be a minus 180, so that would be minus 210. And then this would be another 
180 away from that. So that would be a minus 390 degrees. So we have our y-axis right there going through 0 degrees. And that allows us to see that this cosine function was shifted to the left 30 degrees. And we have enough angle measures there on the theta axis to represent that shift clearly. So the best thing to do when you have a phase shift like this that you're trying to graph is just go ahead and start the y-axis with its center line and then its amplitude drawn on it. Then just go ahead and draw in a sinusoid pattern. Figure out where to draw the real y-axis relative to the phase shift. Let's use a graphing calculator now to show this problem. Remember, a great use of a graphing calculator is to help us check our work. So the first thing we want to do is press the mode button on our calculator and make sure that we have degrees highlighted. When we're working with sine and cosine functions, a lot of times we'll have radians that we, we need our measurements in, or sometimes we need units of degree. So right now we want degrees selected. And the next thing that we would do is go to our y equals button, and then just go ahead and type in 3 plus 2 cosine x plus 30. Next, go to your window button and type in some appropriate values for x and y. And our x values are going to be degrees, so I typed in 180, negative 180 and positive 720, a y min of negative 2, y max of positive 6. It's important to look at your graph and understand your graph so that you can set your window correctly. The 3 and 3 plus 2 cosine x plus 30, that tells us where the center line is going to be. So we would want to be at least 2 in the 2 cosine. That tells us we want to be plus or minus 2 from 3. And so we set our window accordingly. Then we go to graph and we can see our sinusoid pattern here that, that we've developed. We can add a center line by going back to y equals and for y2 just say y2 is equal to 3. And that will just give you a horizontal line at y equals 3. And that's the last graph shown there. And you can see the center line going through y equals 3. Let's look at another problem. This one I've given you the sinusoid function, or its shape anyway. And I want you to write the equation based on the sine function. You could do this sine or cosine, but I want you to do it in terms of the sine function. So let's just go ahead and write down our general form first. That'll be our pattern to help us think about how to solve this. y equals a plus b sine of theta minus d. So let's just think about this. We see there, as it's going up through the horizontal axis right here, at that spot, we see that it's shifted to the right pi over 4, isn't it? Because at that particular spot, sine of theta equals 0. Sine of pi over 4 equals 0. So we're dealing with sine of theta minus pi over 4. Because if theta was equal to pi over 4, we'd have pi over 4 minus pi over 4 is 0. Sine of 0 is 0. To find that phase angle, we always look for the closest spot to the y-axis where the graph is going on an upward curve. Or if it were a cosine function, where it was at a peak. So basically, we finished the probably the most difficult part of graphing a sinusoid pattern is finding that phase shift. Now it's pretty easy to see that the whole graph was shifted up one unit. And so then we would have a 1 for A. The amplitude is a 5. 5 above, 5 below. So we put a 5 right there. And there is our equation for that in terms of the sine function. Let's go on to part C of this lesson on the period of a sinusoid function. And if you recall in lesson five, we learned these standard forms for graphing sine and cosine functions. 
And maybe you noticed on there that we had like an A, which is like the Y or vertical shift. B is the amplitude. D is the phase shift, but we had no variable C in there. It's like we kind of skipped it. Well, the reason for that is because we're going to learn that now. That's the period of a function. The period is how many times the pattern repeats itself every 360 degrees. So I've rewritten those trig functions now, incorporating the period in there. Sine of C times theta minus D, cosine of C times theta minus D. The period, the way you can think about that is C divided by 360. C cycles, I guess you could say, per 360 degrees. So if the period is 2, that means that you'll have two cycles or two repeating patterns in 360 degrees. So let's go ahead and apply what we know now about the period to graphing this function here. B of x is equal to 3 plus 4 cosine 2 theta. Actually, since it's B of x, I should have an x here instead of a theta. Cosine of 2x minus pi over 3. So think about, look at your standard forms up there. Look at your y equals a plus b cosine c times theta minus d. Theta does not have a coefficient in front of it. So we need to factor out 2 from this particular relationship and we'll get 3 plus 4 cosine of 2 parentheses x minus pi over 6. Now the period we can see is 2. This pattern will repeat itself twice every 360 degrees or twice every 2 pi radians is another way to think about it. Let's go ahead and make our horizontal and vertical axes and we'll put a vertical axis over here to the left. We know that we'll start at 3. We have a vertical shift of 3 and then our amplitude is 4 so we'll go up to 7 down to negative 1. Now let's just go ahead and draw a sinusoid pattern in here and we'll just try to keep consistent with our shape or as consistent as we can. Now our phase shift is pi over 6. So think about what's happening here. When x is equal to pi over 6, we would have cosine of 0 or 1. Cosine of 0 degrees equals 1. And so that would be a maximum value. Let's just go ahead and say that pi over 6 is right there. Now, if this pattern repeats itself twice in 360 degrees or twice in 2 pi radians, that would mean that right here would have to be 2 pi radians away or 13 pi over 6 because 13 pi over 6 minus pi over 6 is 12 pi over 6 or 2 pi. And see, so we have one cycle from here to here and then another cycle from that line I just drew to that mark there. Go ahead and put our y-axis in. It would just be to the left a little bit of pi over 6. So maybe right through there. We can just say that's actually since it's a function b of x, we'll say that's the b of x axis there. The horizontal one, we'll call that the x-axis. And we could put one more angle on here. We could say this one is at 6 pi over 6. That's the difference between it and pi over 6. So add that to pi over 6. 7 pi over 6 would be that peak there. So we have our period represented on this graph correctly. Two cycles in 360 or in 2 pi radians. We have that clearly shown. We have some angles shown. We have our vertical shift and our amplitudes as well. That period C that tells you how many repeating patterns or cycles that you get in that sinusoid function per 360 degrees or per every 2 pi radians. Let's go ahead and look at a graphing calculator graph of 3 plus 4 cosine 2x minus 60. Just go to y equals and type that in on your graphing calculator. Set the window like I have here. 
and you should come up with the sinusoidal pattern like I have shown. If you type in y2 equals 3, then you should be able to come up with a horizontal line. You should see that come up the center line for this particular graph. Just a quick comparison of the other graph that we, the, the other sinusoid we graphed in this lesson. We have the same range for our x values. Look at the pattern here. It's a lot more spread out. Basically, our new pattern, it's about twice as many, or not about, it is twice as many because of the 2 in the 2x minus 60. Twice as many cycles for every 360 degrees. Yeah, the first part is on some important numbers that are used in mathematics and probably the four most important numbers in mathematics are 0, 1, pi, and e. All of these are familiar to you. Zero is called the additive identity because any number plus zero is equal to that number. One is the multiplicative identity. Any number multiplied by one is that number. A quick example of that is simplifying or rationalizing a denominator. If we had that, we don't want a square root sign in the denominator, so we multiply by 1, or in this case, the square root of 2 over the square root of 2, which is the same thing as multiplying by 1. So we still have the same value, it just changes the way it looks, square root of 2 over 2. Pi, that just happens to be the ratio of the circumference of a circle to the diameter of the circle. We usually just round it to 3.14, but it is actually an irrational number. Remember, irrational numbers cannot be written as a ratio of integers. E, the E is after the mathematician Leonard Euler, he lived in the 1700s, he did a lot with calculus. He built on what Newton and Leibniz had done. E is sometimes called the natural number. It's also an irrational number. We usually round it, or I usually round it to three decimal places, 2.718. That's the base for a natural logarithm. You know, your calculator, it can do base 10 logarithms and natural logarithms. When you do the LN button on your calculator, natural logarithm, you're finding the exponent for the base of E, 2.718. There are lots of natural relationships in the physical world that have exponential patterns to them, and they have a base of E. That's why we use E. I mean, it just seems kind of weird to have this irrational number rounded to 2.718. I mean, why is that an important base? Well, the same thing could be asked of pi. Why is the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle equal to 3.14? Why did it end up like that? Well, we don't know that. That's just how God made it, basically. That's, that's the best answer we have. We'll never know why the circumference to the diameter is equal to 3.14. Why 2.718 works as a base in many exponential relationships that help us predict patterns in the physical world. We don't know why those things are like that, but we've found that they are. Well, since we're talking about exponential relationships, let's go on to part E of this lesson on exponential functions. Remember, a function has, for every input, one and only one output. A standard form of an exponential function is y equals b to the x, or if we want to use functional notation, we could say f of x equals b to the x, where b is some base, and basically b has to be greater than 1, because 1 to any power is just going to be 1 itself. You don't really get an exponential relationship out of that. 
Now, B can be less than 1 as well. So I guess a better way to think about this is that B is greater than or equal to 0 and B is not equal to 1. Because it could be a fraction. It could be a half or a fourth. But it can't be negative. It can't equal 0. And it cannot equal 1. Let's go ahead and graph some exponential functions, and that will help us refresh our memory about how these work. Let's graph y equals 2 to the x first, and we'll just go ahead and make a Cartesian coordinate system. Maybe you already are remembering the basic shape of an exponential function, and just think of two points. That's all we need to do, and when x is 0, y is equal to 1. And that's the case for all exponential functions of that basic form, a base to a power. So let's put a point there at 0, 1. And think about it when x is 1, y would be 2 to the 1, or 2. So when x is 1, y is 2, we could put a point there. And let's think about one other number. Let's do negative 2. When x is negative 2, we would have 2 to the negative 2 power. Think about how we would simplify that. That's the same thing as saying 1 over 2 squared. We can always change the sign of an exponent by putting it in the denominator. 1 over 2 squared is 1 over 4. So that's a small value for y when x is negative 2. And we can go ahead and draw a curve through those points to estimate the function, that exponential function, estimate its shape. Remember, when we're thinking about functions, we're thinking about a graph of an algebraic relationship, thinking about what it would, what its graph would look like on the Cartesian coordinate system. Remember, calculus is about working with instantaneous rates of changes. And we do a lot with functions in calculus, so you could conclude that calculus deals with working with instantaneous rates of changes of functions. Looking at what's happening at a certain spot, like that dot that I just drew on there, a certain spot on a function. Just keep that in the back of your mind as we're reviewing these different concepts and building up to our learning and understanding of the calculus. So we just graphed y equals 2 to the x. Let's go to b now. If you want to, you could pause the CD and try to do b, c, and d, and then turn the CD back on and check your solutions. So on b here, we have y equals e to the x. Let's go ahead and make a Cartesian coordinate system again. Let's make your tick marks as evenly spaced as you can. And Again, we know that this one's going to go through 0, comma 1, so we could put a dot there. And E is 2.718, so when X is 1, we'd have 2.718 for Y, or just a little bit under 3, we could put a dot there. And we know the pattern will look like that, so we can just go ahead and draw that in. It doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, it's not like drawing a line. It's hard it's easy to draw an, a line fairly accurately, but a curve like this, you have to do like 10 or 20 or 50 points to get its exact shape. So we, we kind of estimate the shape. We know it has that curved pattern going upwards like that. The larger the base is greater than 1, the steeper it curves up. And if the base is greater than 1, it always curves up to the right. If the base is a fraction less than 1, it will curve to the left, curve up and to the left. Let's move on to C now. Y equals e to the minus x. Let's just make our Cartesian coordinate system first. And let's just think about this. Now we have a negative exponent or negative x up there. So when x is 0, we'll still have e to the 0, or 1, we'll still have a point at 0, 1. Then let's just think about this. When x is a positive 2, 
we would have e to the negative 2 or 1 over e squared. That would be equal to about 0.135. So now what's happening is as x gets more positive, y gets smaller. And we'll basically make a reflection of the graphs that we've been doing. It's going to go up and to the left, kind of like what we were just talking about. Think about why that is. If you look at e to the minus x, we could change this using the power rule for exponents. We could say e to the minus 1 parentheses x. That's the same thing as e to the minus x because we just, using the power rule for exponents, we have minus 1 times x is minus x. e to the minus 1 is 1 over e. So we're really saying 1 over e to the x power. So that's a fraction less than 1. That's what I was just saying. When we have as our base a fraction less than 1, it's going to curve up and to the left. Let's apply what we just learned there to doing problem D. And we have y equals minus e to the minus x. So we could just write that y equals minus e, minus 1 over e, actually, to the power of x, minus 1 over e to the power of x. We'll draw our Cartesian coordinate system. And let's just think about this now. When x is 0, we'd have 1 over e to the 0, which is 1, but we have a minus in front of it. So when x is 0, y is minus 1. It's down there now. Basically, what's going to happen here is this graph will be a reflection of the graph of C about the x-axis. It'll just look like this. It'll curve down that way. Now, it's important to remember our rules for our base for an exponential function. The base can be greater than or equal to 0, but it cannot equal 1. So if it's greater than... Actually, that's, I made a little error there. It's greater than zero. It can't be equal to zero, right? B has to be greater than zero and not equal to one. It can't equal one. It can't equal zero. And it can't be less than zero either. It can't be a negative number. So that's a big problem a lot of times is keeping up with your negative sign. When you have y equals minus e to the minus x, that's telling you that the negative sign is separate from that function. This is, that's impossible. You can't have minus e to a power. So you won't see any exponential functions that have the negative sign inside parentheses like that. It'll just be like problem D was y equals minus e to the minus x. Just know that you work with e to the minus x, work with that part, and then whatever, when you substitute an x value in and simplify that, then just multiply by negative 1 when you're done. So we had y equals e to the x, y equals e to the minus x, y equals minus e to the minus x. One thing we didn't do was y equals minus e to the x. That would just be a reflection of b, practice problem b, about the x-axis. It would just look like that. That would be minus e to the x, wouldn't it? Be careful about your negative signs when you're working with these exponential functions. And refamiliarize yourself with what the graph of 1 looks like. Let me repeat it one more time since I made that mistake there. The base can be greater than 0, but it cannot equal 1. That's the rules for determining a base of an exponential function. It can be greater than zero, but it cannot equal one. Okay, well that's all for lesson seven.